using yeah. your explanation to sure. this, and correct me again where I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like there's no need to have any of this discussion about downsizing government or controlling spending or any of that because it's not really an issue. In an important sense, you're right, but what that does is it brings up the, the larger issue is, okay, if, if you have a state government or a local government, you have to size that government according to your revenues because you need that money to be able to spend. The federal government doesn't need the money to spend, so how does it decide what's the right size for the federal government? Well, unfortunately, we base it on the amount of revenues, and that's where we go wrong. It has to be based on public purpose. How many soldiers do we need to properly defend ourselves? Have a big debate. Come, come on with it. Do we need a missile system? Do we need a, uh, you know, anti-missile system? Do we need nuclear submarines? What do we need to defend ourselves? Okay, what do we need for the mission? What do we? What size legal system do we need? How many judges, law clerks, buildings do we need? Well, if you have to wait two years for an appointment, maybe we need to expand that or make it certainly make it more efficient. But assuming it's efficient, if you have to wait two years, maybe we need to expand the capacity. If the courts are calling you up, asking you to please sue somebody because they have a lot of room, extra room, that means we've got too many people in that legal system. We need to cut it back. There's a right size legal system based on our legal needs. There's a right size system for the police department. There's a right size system for everything we do as government, and that's a political choice. Now, the larger we make government, the more people and the more resources we're taking out of the private sector. And we're diminishing our ability to produce private sector goods and services, which are also important. And so if we put everybody in government, we'd have no one to build the cars, no one to grow the food, and we'd all starve to death at home, you know, freeze to death in the dark. We'd have no one running the electric plants and no one doing the research and development. So the real cost of government is the resources that we take out of the private sector. And that's a very important decision of what is, what is the appropriate amount of resources to take of the private sector. Now there are some people who want the government to be this big for um, further purpose and some want it to be that big. But at the end of the day, government is all about public infrastructure, okay, all for further public purpose. It supports the private sector. It's a support function. And we have to decide as a political decision what the right size government should be. And so, sure, we could make it as large or as small as we want. We have the tools to do that. But there's a cost, and the real cost is diminishing the private sector. Right now, for the size government we have, uh, there is a right, and I've said it to repeat, there's a right size tax level that will result in full employment of the remaining private sector. And right now, we are grossly overtaxed for the size government that we do have, as evidenced by the bodies in the unemployment line, the people who are struggling with unemployment, who want good jobs, and we need to like, cut taxes yesterday. I've been proposing this since 2008. If we had done this in August 2008, when I first started proposing it, unemployment never would have gotten over 6%. And it would be probably at 4% today. But it didn't happen. We've had two administrations now fail to understand the purpose of federal taxes is to regulate the economy. Instead, they still see it as they're bringing revenue that they must balance with expenditures. It's a, it's a tragic mistake. It's, Again, I'm here running as a matter of conscience to get this out, doing everything I can, uh, getting on every possible, in every possible venue I can, and making the point the best I can. All right. Maybe this is apples and oranges. Yeah. Maybe it yeah. makes no sense at all. But <clears throat> let's go back 30 years. Yeah. Uh, Ronald Reagan comes on in. We're in the midst of a Cold War with Russia. Yeah. Reagan builds up the military. Russia can't keep up. Berlin Wall falls. All of that was just people moving numbers around. Well, no. Well, let's look at what Reagan did. First of all, he cut taxes. Okay. The federal deficit when he came in with, I think, somewhere around a trillion dollars. And then Congress uh, increased spending. Okay. And by uh, 10 years later, the deficit was up to uh, $3 trillion. It had tripled. All right. And what happened? We had one of the best economies, you know, one of the better economies in U.S. history. But why did Russia collapse? It, it, well, it, 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 if governments yeah. work that way, yeah. and we're building up our military, right. forcing, yeah. as, the, as the legend goes, we yeah. force Russia to try and keep up, uh, right. the, the Soviet Union, keep up with us, they couldn't, yeah. and that brought about the collapse of the Soviet yeah. Union. Right. I, I see it a little bit differently, but that could have been the case. And so there is, a, and when I say we need to have the right size military, part of our military strategy could be, if we build the military up, then China will have to build theirs up and they'll collapse. Now, that's not my military strategy, but maybe that was Reagan's. We have the ability to execute that strategy. The monetary system will facilitate the execution of any strategy we want, as long as we have the real resources available, the people, the planes, the metal, the technology to do it. So the monetary system will accommodate 
that kind of strategy. Now, when I look back, and I, I was talking about the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, at least 10 years before it happened. I didn't predict the exact date. I don't know anyone did. But they had an economic system where when they expanded into a region, the economy collapsed, and they had to supply that region with real goods and services. So when they went into East Germany, the economy collapsed, and they had to give them oil and food and real goods and services. When they went into Cuba, the economy collapsed, and they could get all the sugar they wanted, but they had to give Cuba everything else. So as they expanded, core Russia got bled dry, exporting to all their um, sphere of influence. Okay. The United States, on the, under, on the other hand, the opposite was happening. After we uh, took over Japan, or whatever you want to call it, after Japan was part of our sphere of influence, they started sending us two million cars a year. We sent them nothing. West Germany was sending us cars, trucks, and machine tools. We were sending them nothing. We were running a trade deficit. We had the luxury of running a trade deficit. Every country, uh, Southeast Asia, everybody we added to our sphere of influence would send us products. So what we were, we were doing was making us richer. What Russia was doing was bleeding them dry until they couldn't produce enough to support all these people. And, and the system collapsed and they let them go. Well, if everybody's sending us stuff, then yeah. we don't need a reason to make stuff. Exactly. Which is, which, which. And so we can be healthcare workers and scientists and you know, we can sit here and do this. There was a time a couple of hundred years ago we couldn't sit here and do this. We would starve to death. We'd be out making sure the harvest had to come in. We used to take everybody out growing the food and taking care of things just to sustain ourselves. But through technology and uh, you know, improved productivity, it only takes 1% of the people to grow all the food we want plus export food. It takes less than 10% of the people to manufacture all the things we want now. And that's down from 70 or 80% at one time. Okay. If we got any more people in manufacturing, this room would be filled up with junk. We wouldn't know what to do with it. And, and that 10% is going to go to 9 to 8 to 7 as our productivity increases. And then we, that frees us up to work in the service sector and do all these other things that we've never been able to do before uh, in terms of all our technology and software writing. And, you know, look at all the hundreds of thousands of stockbrokers we can afford to have us calling us up every day. Now, it's important to direct what resources, you know, what we do with our service sector. Otherwise, we can uh, bury ourselves in, you know, legal work and, and the financial sector which is a complete waste of human endeavor. But the point is, yes, look, from a, from a pure economic standpoint, imports, uh, the real wealth of our country is everything we can, think of it as your pile. Your pile is your real wealth. Everything we can produce domestically at full employment, plus everything the rest of the world sends us, minus what we have to send now. Okay. The way the economist says it is imports are real benefits, exports are real costs. Economics is the opposite of religion. In economics, it's better to receive than to give. Okay. The problem is when we receive all these imports from overseas, we don't know how to keep ourselves fully employed because we think we need taxes to be able to spend. And so we, all these imports allows us to lower taxes more, you know, even lower, to reduce taxes even more so that we have enough spending money to buy everything we can produce domestically plus whatever the world wants to send us. That's exactly what we did 10 years ago. Ten years ago, unemployment was under 4%. I think it got down to 3.7. We were growing 4, 5, and 6%. And we were net importing oh, like $380 billion worth of stuff back when that was a lot of money. And that's even more than we're doing today. And so we had enough spending power here at home to be able to buy everything we produced at full employment plus $380 billion of net imports. Okay. And kids getting out of school, you know, in June would be getting job offers in March and April. I mean, we had a good economy going, because we had enough spending power. Well, we were doing it all on credit cards, and it didn't last. It was unsustainable. Our ability to expand credit at 7% of GDP was unsustainable, and it collapsed. Well, that's okay. Once your credit cards get taken away, we can sustain the income. We can sustain our spending through income instead of credit by lowering taxes. And personally, I'd much rather see people spending from income than from credit anyway. And you know, leave the banks alone if they don't want to lend. It just means we can have lower taxes we can, and get our income that way. We can always afford to, to uh, buy what you can produce. Okay? You know, you're not going to get inflation until, look, inflation comes from too much money uh, chasing too few goods and services. Okay? It comes from too much spending, trying to buy more than what's offered for sale. We've got the opposite problem now. We have everything's for sale. Every house in this city, I'm sure, is offered for sale and, and not enough spending power to buy it. Right now, we're grossly overtaxed. You'll know when we're undertaxed. That's when people have too much money and they're just causing inflation. You've got to be getting some 
odd looks from people that you're out there campaigning, suggesting Just that, like this room. Yeah, <laughs> that, you know, that, you know, the deficit's no big deal, uh, trade deficits are good things. I mean, yeah. uh, Trade deficit's been an enormous benefit. Look, if, if MacArthur, General MacArthur had gone into Japan in 1945 and said, look, we won the war, we've got more nuclear weapons, here's the deal, you're going to send us two million cars a year forever, and we're going to send you nothing. Okay, it would have been a big uproar. You can't do that to those poor people. We tried to do that to Germany after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, and it started World War III. That's exploitation. You can't do it. Okay. Well, what actually happened in real terms? Okay. Ever since 1945, how many years ago? 65 years. They've been sending us two million cars every year. We've been sending them nothing. Somebody from Mars looking down would say, oh, it's the biggest case of uh, war reparations in the history of the world. That's far more than anybody asked for Germany at the end of World War II, at the end of World War I. Okay. And yet, they've been doing it voluntarily and trying to keep it going. And uh, we've been sending tra trade negotiators to try and stop it. China has become the world's slaves. They've been sending us all these things, and we send them nothing. This is an enormous benefit. The problem is we don't know how to keep ourselves fully employed while they're doing it, so we get the benefits of everything they want to send us on the cheap, plus everything we can build here domestically. Now, if you look at uh, what my opponents are talking about and what the administration and the bipartisan agreement is trying to do, is they're trying to get China to revalue the currency make the yuan stronger, their currency stronger, and the dollar weaker. The reason for that is it, it makes everything in the department stores more expensive, so we can't afford to buy them, and so we stop buying things from China that way. It's like, what sense does that make? Versus lowering our taxes so we can buy all that cheap stuff and buy everything we can produce domestically, just like we did 10 years ago, have full employment and good jobs here, and, and at the same time keep all the inexpensive imports. That's the way to do it. It's not like we haven't done it before. So those little plastic dolls, yeah. the WWE that they get from overseas, yeah. that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It means, okay. you know. Which, which, which is what Mr. Blumenthal <coughs> yeah. criticized and, and, uh, and, Mrs. McMahon. And Mrs. Uh, McMahon yeah. wasn't able to defend it properly because she didn't understand it. She sort of agrees and blamed it on taxes, which are causing our businesses to move overseas. Okay. Those are good things. Those are not bad things because that means our kids, instead of working in some silly factory, you know, in some sweatshop at minimum wage trying to produce these things, can be corporate executives and advertising executives and be working for, you know, our software companies producing new software and all kinds of things. And we can have more healthcare workers. We've got a shortage of healthcare workers right now. Not that there's a shortage of people to do it, but we have a shortage of, you know, we have enormous need in the healthcare industry just to take care of people. Yeah. One of your points is regarding yeah. people working yeah. is to give everybody who's not working an eight-hour an hour job. Yes. And so I've got... Um, you're aware that that's not even the minimum wage. Right. That would be a federally funded $8 job. The, the minimum wage is a Connecticut minimum wage, which is $8.25. Right. Okay. Even if Connecticut wants to supplement, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. Or if the government wants to, uh, you know, I'm, I, it's not about whether it's $8 or eight and a quarter. Yeah. Let, let me explain it to you. Okay. Okay. Um, and Connecticut can make an exemption for the federal government. The federal government, I believe, would be exempt from that. Because the federal government is just offering it. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not requiring anybody to work for that. Here's the more important point. The payroll tax holiday is going to cause an enormous um, burst of growth. New jobs, employers, sales go up, business goes up, the economy starts, starts booming again, we get back to a good economy. The, what, what happens, the problem, the remaining problem is that businesses do not like to hire people who've been unemployed. They don't like to hire, especially the long-term unemployed. They just can't get jobs. It's too risky for business to hire them because they don't know if they're on drugs. They don't know if they will take a shower and when they come to work. They don't know if they can get in fights. You know, there's just not enough, and it's, and it's expensive to hire somebody. And there's an investment involved, and business likes far prefers to hire somebody who's already working. Okay, so this eight dollar an hour federally funded job is a, is designed to be a transition job to facilitate the movement of people from who are unemployed to private sector employment by giving them a job where they can show what they can do. They uh, come in. Oh, sorry. 